gold in this case has been placed on an asbestos liner to assure a clean melt. A properly adjusted casting flame is used to melt the alloy and the flame is of course directed so that the most efficient heating rate is obtained. If you see a black dot like this, you're too close. So back off a little and utilize the reducing portion or the blue tip of the flame to get optimal efficiency. At this time, the melt is almost ready and the ring can be placed in the cradle. The tray is then slid into intimate contact with the ring. Make sure that this is contacting the ring. The pin is dropped, but the machine is held in position and then carefully and gently released to make the casting. Once the machine has come to a complete stop, the tray is pulled forward and away from the ring. The ring is removed and inspected to make sure that we have a proper button. The ring is then quenched in some water and make sure to hold a rubber bowl underneath this simply because you want to be able to retrieve the casting. Also when you do this in a sink and please throw the investment in the trash can rather than in the sink. The casting can now readily be retrieved by pushing the entire assembly out of the ring. The casting is retrieved and now can be cleaned with a toothbrush and a running water. The casting is carefully placed on the bottom of a container with general purpose or preferably stone and plaster remover, which is positioned in one of the ultrasonic units, which is turned on for a cycle to make sure that all investment is indeed removed. Once clean, the casting is placed in hydrochloric acid, preferably using your rubber tip tweezers over a Bunsen burner. The casting can be removed from the hydrochloric acid after all surface oxides have been eliminated through the pickling procedure. We are now ready to start to seat the crown on the sprue. Once the casting has been retrieved and rinsed under uh, under water, running water from the tap, inspect it carefully for any voids or deficiencies in the marginal area. Note that a couple of small blebs are present, which of course will have to be removed in the finishing process. Similarly, the internal aspect is inspected. No excessive flow lines or foreign matter should be present. Any nodules on the internal aspect will interfere with the seating of the crown. You can see that here we have a rather big nodule which will be removed with a small round burr. Never should a casting be adjusted on the internal aspect indiscriminately. You should only grind in the area of the, of the void. Whenever the internal surface is adjusted, be very careful not to damage the margins. Good finger rest positioning is critical.
Once all nodules and any other voids have been removed, the casting is carefully tried on the die until some resistance against vertical displacement is felt. The casting is then removed from the die and again the internal aspect is inspected to see if it can be determined visually where it may bind. If such is not possible, a marking agent, typically a water-soluble paint, can be used to coat the inside of the casting. The internal surface is coated and the marking agent is immediately blown into a thin layer so as not to interfere with seating. The marking agent should be dry before the crown is reseated on the die. The casting is then gently reseated again until the point of meeting resistance against further seating is encountered, carefully removed, and the internal aspect is again studied. In this instance, this crown appears to be binding right in this area, and a small additional adjustment in just that area can be made. An alternative to this technique is the use of rouge and chloroform as a marking agent. Once the adjustment has been made, the casting is reseated on the die and the process is repeated until the casting fully seats. At that time, the marking agent is removed by placing the crown in some distilled water in an ultrasonic cleaner. Once the casting is fully seated, it is inspected for marginal integrity as well as stability on the die. No discrepancy should be present at the junction between casting and die. Circumferentially, no shadow line should be visible. If a gap is present, either the casting is not fully seated or perhaps the pattern was warped at the wax up stage and the procedure needs to be repeated. Once satisfied that the fit is acceptable, the button can be removed and we are ready to proceed through the rubber wheel stage. The button is cut off by cutting with a separating disc circumferentially around the sprue. It is preferable to do this rather than to fully section the entire sprue at once since the risk of fracture of the disc and potential injury is reduced. It is recommended that at all times when using rotary equipment, you wear safety glasses. The button can then simply be twisted off and any remaining excess is dressed down with the disc. The remaining portion of sprue is removed with a separating disc and the original contour that existed in wax is re-established with this highly abrasive disc. A sandpaper disc is used next until a satiny finish is obtained. The key to successful surface finishing is not to switch too rapidly to the next abrasive. 
each abrasive should be used until it no longer appears to result in any additional smoothing of the surface finish. In this preliminary stage before soldering, only the actual walls are finished and the cervical millimeter or so immediately adjacent to the margin is left untouched. That will not be finished until after the soldering procedure of the bridge has been completed. When working with these types of abrasives, no facets should remain. Be careful not to remove too much gold from the cusp tips in the areas of the centric stops. This type of finish is acceptable to proceed with the next step of abrasive. A white flexi can be trued and subsequently thinned on any suitable truing stone. A heatless wheel serves equally well to accomplish this. The key element when performing this procedure is to maintain a thick and sturdy center on the disc but simultaneously have a thin tapered edge that allows access to such areas as narrow interproximal embrasures and also allows finishing of convex surfaces with ease. During the rubber wheeling procedure, it may be necessary to true the rubber flexi back to its configuration. The key to successful use of a rubber wheel is to use it at relatively low revolutionary speed with reasonably high pressure. You will note that the disc actually bends during this rubber wheeling stage and the resulting friction will make the casting quite warm. Initially, you'll have to learn to get used to holding these somewhat warm objects while you're working on them, but there really is no easy way around it. If it becomes too much, you may wish to cool it off in a little rubber bowl with some water. At the completion of the rubber wheeling stage, the casting should no longer have any facets and be in a pre-polished finish so that only high shining of the existing contour remains necessary. The last step that remains before investing for soldering is to remove the skin off the occlusal surface with a metal wire brush. until a satin finish has been obtained. Once all three castings have been finished to the rubber wheel stage and no facetting is present, you're ready to proceed with the indexing for soldering.